This is a podcast from the Business Times. A few years ago, more people opened accounts under the Supplementary Retirement Scheme, or SRS, amid economic uncertainties. SRS was introduced at the turn of the century and encourages people to save up for retirement beyond their CPF savings. Plus, it allows you to use the funds for investment and receive tax relief. Sure sounds like a win-win. But what holds people back from opening SRS accounts and what should you invest in to make the most of it? This is Money Hacks, a podcast series by The Business Times, where we explore useful financial tips to help you on your money managing and wealth growing journey. I'm Howie Lim. Joining us today, Hugh Chung, Endowa's Chief Investment Advisory Officer, and Jamin Wong, Head of Intermediary Southeast Asia, State Street Global Advisors, who's a big proponent of using SRS to get tax breaks and grow your retirement fund. SRS is actually a topic that I have been quite passionate about for many years. And really, I think it's a very good scheme that has been introduced by the Ministry of Finance, and it's extremely underutilized in Singapore today. In my line of work, I spend a lot of time doing education to retail investors as to how to invest, what to invest, primarily educating them of the benefits of ETFs. And part and parcel of that is to encourage investments into ETFs under the Supplementary Retirement Scheme because there are a lot of benefits for investing via SRS. The Ministry of Finance, they publish data annually about SRS statistics Actually, today, the adoption rate is not as bad as before. It has grown substantially, I would say. As of the end of 2023, we have slightly over 427,000 SRS accounts with total SRS contributions of about $18.4 billion. So if you look at 2021, two years ago, there were only 288,000 accounts. So this actually represents a approximately 48% increase in the total number of SRS accounts and an additional $4 billion that had been contributed. It's $4 billion of tax deductibles for SRS contributors. In December 2018, there were only 156,000 accounts. And the number of accounts in the past five years, new SRS accounts actually increased almost revolt from 150,000 to 420,000 today account holders. However, 420,000 as a proportion of the number of taxpayers, total taxpayers in Singapore. If you ask me, that's still a fairly low amount. In fact, it could and it should go up to at least a million account holders. Hu Chung from Endowas agrees, but he feels that certain investment instruments might not be the most appropriate. Yeah, so SRS accounts are tax-efficient accounts. The good news is that unlike CPF, there are many, many very high-quality mutual funds that are already available for SRS investments. So I would treat long-term investment the same as any investment that you invest through your cash funding as well. So if you think about long-term goals with SRS, you should really try to create a balanced portfolio that is in line with the risk appetite that you have. And by nature, a lot of the SRS accounts should be long-term. So it gives you a little bit more room to take on more risk. But essentially, you should build your portfolio with the best building blocks within passive, systematic, as well as active portfolios. It really is about long-term goal-based investing and using the right building blocks for it. The whole idea of SRS is to make sure you get the tax benefit or the tax deferral, in a sense, and using that to invest. Making sure that you're investing in in a transparent, low-cost and well-diversified portfolio is, is very, very important. It sounds like to me SRS is not for everyone. It hangs on one's income, doesn't it? Because, for example, let's say one earns $50,000 per annum and you contribute the maximum $15,300 to the SRS account. So instead of being taxed for an income of $50,000, you're taxed for an income of $34,700. So that's a $15,300 tax deductible. I like the sound of that. But if one's income is in the lower range, it may not make as much sense. There are some other cons to consider with regard to the SRS. Here's Jermaine from State Street again. For example, after you contribute, you can withdraw it at any time. So it's not like CPF. But when you choose to withdraw, there is a penalty unless there are exceptional reasons. And that penalty is 5%. Uh, And 
plus it will be any withdrawal will be taxed to your income for that particular year. So what I always tell our retail clients is that SRS actually is a very good tool for a rainy day. For example, when you're unemployed. So let's say today you're paying an effective tax uh, tax bracket of 10 to 15 percent, right? If you contribute 15,003, you are effectively saving 10 to 15 percent of $15,300 in taxes, uh, in income tax. Let's say there's an economy downturn, you lose your job a couple of years down the road, and you've got no income for that year. You choose to withdraw that 15,003, you pay a penalty of 5%, which is much less than what you should have paid in taxes in this year. And on top of that, it's added to your income for the year. But if you're unemployed, you've got no income for that year, then the taxes that you pay on that withdrawal would be little to none. So it's actually a very good tool for preparation for such rainy days. Still to come, what exactly are the best things to invest in to make the most of our SRS? More in a moment. Money Hacks now comes to you every Monday. Get useful financial tips every week. How much to save, what to invest in, how we limb asks the experts, so you have the answers. Money Hacks by the Business Times. Every Monday, go to bt.sg slash moneyhacks or wherever you get your podcasts. And now, back to Money Hacks from the Business Times. That really depends on people's risk appetites. Today, there are certain robo-advisors in the market that allow you to utilize your SRS money as well through their robo-advisory platform. Welcome back to Money Hacks. We've been talking about where you should invest your SRS monies. Jermaine Wong is the head of Intermediary Southeast Asia, State Street Global Advisors, and has always been a proponent of using one's SRS to invest and grow their retirement nest egg. There are a lot of benefits, again, to ETF investing, and, and one of them is cost. ETFs are basically passively managed investment products where it passively tracks and index. Oh, well, there are active ETFs today, but most ETFs are still passive. Because of the nature of ETFs and the nature of it being a passive investment, costs of ETF tend to be lower than most other investment products. If you look on the Singapore exchange and the ETFs listed on the Singapore exchange, which are available for SRS investments, the expense ratio of this ETFs range anywhere from nine basis points to maybe 60 basis points per annum. And that's 0.09% to 0.6% of management fee per annum you compare that to fees and costs that you pay for investing in unit trusts or investing in endowment plans. And then those have their benefits as well, I'm sure. But if you're just looking at cost, then ETFs would be significantly lower. And that is one of the key trends that have been driving ETF adoption in Singapore. If you look at the past four years from 2019 to 2023, ETF adoption on SGX grew by more than double. And this is just retail adoption from retail investors. We are excluding any institutional investors. Hugh Chung, Chief Investment Advisory Officer at Endowers, has different ideas though. I don't have any negative views on ETFs per se. The kind of pros and cons of using ETFs versus unit trusts are, I think when people compare ETFs versus unit trusts, in the market, they have this tendency to think that ETFs are much cheaper because the traditional way of buying unit trust has been through banks and it's incurred commissions, retrocession fees, etc. But the discussion and costs are a lot more nuanced than that, particularly at a place like in Dallas where we don't actually charge sales charge or retrocessions. And it's because there are a few components to, to costs. One is that if you actually buy ETFs, which you do like a security in an exchange, you actually incur a bid-ask spread, which basically means the spread between the buyer and the seller wanting to clear that cost. And the bid-ask spread becomes wider if the exchange doesn't have liquidity. So the same type of ETF that trades in SGX versus the US market could be different. This is something that people are not as aware of. The second point is that if you look at the fees itself, Sometimes it's difficult to see what a ETF charges. I think passive funds are pretty straightforward, but there's a lot of active funds now that have you know fees embedded that it's hard to see. 
The last point is on tax implications. If you are buying U.S. securities through an ETF, you will likely incur what we call a withholding tax. But if you buy unit trusts that are USITs, which are the EU-regulated mutual funds, then you have a benefit of not incurring that withholding tax. So the cost side is very nuanced, but people tend to think that ETFs are much cheaper than unit trusts. So we don't have anything against ETFs. It's just that a lot of these retirement schemes are retirement focused, right? So it's very, very long term. And unit trusts are very effective ways to buy long term investments that are goal based. So again, it's more that we are a retirement focused long term wealth debt platform. And that's why we prefer unit trusts. But there are pros and cons for these two vehicles. Jameen acknowledges this, despite his penchant for recommending ETFs as the investment product du jour. It's not a light a light comparison. Most unit trusts or mutual funds today are actively managed. What this means is that there is a asset manager that is looking to stock pick or pick bonds or single stocks to try and outperform the index. So say, for example, if you're investing in a Singapore equity fund, the objective of the fund manager really is to outperform the STI. And depending on whether or not the fund manager can adequately outperform and consistently outperform the benchmark in the long term would determine whether or not it would make sense for you to be investing in that unit trust. There are some very good active fund managers out there. And if they can consistently outperform net of fees, then absolutely it makes sense to invest in that unit trust. Now, the ETF, all it does is that it's extremely low cost. It tracks the index. So if we're looking up at the STI ETF, for example, it would track the Straits Times Index. It would not overweight or underweight any particular stock. It would not try to outperform the index. It would try to track the index as closely as possible. To an investor, it's how confident are you in the investment capabilities of an asset manager to consistently outperform net of fees. And if you are, And if there's a proven track record, then perhaps a unit trust might be a very good option. But if not, then an ETF would be a very hassle-free, fuss-free, low-cost, transparent option where you you can trade on the SGX at any time you want, just like a stock. It sounds like what one picks is really up to you and the basics of investing still apply. Do your homework, know your appetite, know your goals and all that. Let's say you're a relatively young person with a very long-term horizon, it's okay to put a very large amount in a globally diversified set of equities. But the important thing here is that it is globally diversified, which means it's not just about the US market either, as good as it has been. I think it would be helpful to have a portfolio that is diversified, not just in US, but other developed markets and emerging markets as well. And there's probably at least 200 plus SRS approved unit trusts that we can offer as well. So it really depends on the risk appetite. I can't give you a one stop answer. But the good news is that we already have these kind of pre-populated balanced portfolios available. A big thank you to Jermaine Wong, Head of Intermediary Southeast Asia, State Street Global Advisors, and Hugh Chung, Chief Investment Advisory Officer at Endowers. Next time, what do you make of some of the Gen Z money trends making the rounds on social media and how effective can they be on our wealth-growing journey? This has been Money Hacks from the Business Times. I'm Howie Lim. Till next time. This is a podcast by the Business Times. Find more BT podcasts at businesstimes.com.sg slash podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is meant to provide general information only. SPH Media accepts no liability for loss arising from any reliance on the podcast or use of third parties' products and services. Please consult professional advisors for independent advice.